Hi folks, this is Dr. Olson. I have a PhD in New Testament, but my research and teaching is focused on the interpretation of the scriptures in the liturgy and Christian life of the first thousand years or so in the Christian West. Uh, this is for SL553 Patristics, a uh, class on the Church Fathers for third year seminarians at St. Mary's Seminary here in Baltimore, and also for other purposes as well. After teaching early church history for a while, I realized that it would be very beneficial uh, to start with a big picture drive-by of the history of the patristic period to help provide some political and economic context for what was going on when these people were writing and teaching things. So, covering 700 years in under 15 minutes, why exactly would we want to do this? Uh, first, Christian thought does not occur in a vacuum. Theology is it's, it's incarnate. It's deeply tied to politics and economics, especially in this period. As a result, you have to have a sense of the broad scope of the period from 50 AD through 750 or so to understand the massive political changes, the massive social changes, the massive economic changes, and the changing theological needs of the church, which all leads to why the church fathers became the church fathers. Now, it's a big world, and we tend to forget that. Indeed, that's one of our problems. Most of what we, and when I say we, I mean like you and me, are familiar with from this period is written from the perspective of European and American academics. And for the past 200 years, that means that world history has actually been European history. But that's not what we're going to be working with today. Advances in archeology span and genetic anthropology and pottery analysis, access to languages other than just Greek and Latin, have shifted our perspective quite a bit on what we know and what we can say about this period just in the last 30 years or so. Thus, instead of this just being the fall of Rome, it's actually best thought of as a big shift east. And you'll see what I mean by that as we go along. So rather than the whole world or the eastern hemisphere as pictured here, we're only going to be looking at a small section of it, primarily the area that started as the Roman Empire and the lands that put pressure on it. So rather, we'll say that our scope is the Mediterranean oikumene. Uh, oikumene is, is the Greek word that means inhabited world. Uh, and, and so it, it refers to this section and, and the people living in it. It works better uh, for this region instead of, say, going by continents, because we've got three different continents that are all an important part of this Roman world. It also includes important peripheral regions like Northern Europe and the Middle East, but it's centered primarily around the Mediterranean. So let's take a moment to talk about some key geographic and economic factors at work here. First, notice that the Mediterranean is literally in the middle of the Roman Empire. This is really important. Carrying things over land is hard. Traveling over water is a lot easier. It's still dangerous, but it's much simpler. The Roman Empire is the first and only time that a single political entity has controlled all of the lands bordering the Mediterranean. Uh, the Roman epithet Mare Nostrum, our sea, is entirely accurate. Now, not all land areas are created equal in terms of economic production. Working off tax records from the early empire, uh, we can compare some regions in terms of how much grain they produced. So Egypt sent 135,000 tons of grain to Rome each year. 135,000 tons. North Africa sent 108,000 tons of grain. Sicily, uh, 20,000 tons of grain. Note, this isn't tons of production. This is tons of surplus. So they fed all the people there and still had all this grain to send. This should tell you just how important North Africa and Egypt are. The other piece of the economic puzzle is that there's one more region in the Mediterranean, Oikomene, that's also capable of producing grain on a comparable level, and that's modern uh, Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. Now, I, I can't give you a great figure for their annual production because they weren't sending taxes to Rome. Uh, now, based on these uh, comments about geography and, and such, uh, let me give you three key characteristics of the Roman Empire. These are characteristics that the Roman Empire had and that what followed it, what we get to by the end of the period, does not have these three things. 
So, first off, stable and complex trade routes that enable local specializations. Um, so this means we've got trade routes that are capable of carrying bulk goods at a profit. That's unusual, and it allows for specialization. If I can get grain at a decent price from far away, then I can specialize in olives or grapevines, and I don't have to waste time uh, and effort and space on a crop that doesn't grow well where I live. This kind of specialization is essential for a complex, diversified economy. Second, cities. Urbanization. Uh, the Roman Empire was and saw itself as an urban phenomenon. So the red dots on this map here, these represent 23 cities that all had over 20,000 inhabitants. Overall, the urbanization rate across the empire was just shy of 10%. Cities were how Roman politics and social display worked. If you were an aristocrat, even if your wealth was due to your many country estates, you displayed it and leveraged it politically in cities. And notice too, look at where the red dots are. The vast majority of the major cities of the Roman Empire are not in Italy. Right? It, it's over here, it's in the east. Remember that. Third, the first and second things, characteristics, are intimately related through the third. What we tend to forget is that any person living in a city is a person who is not growing food. Given the technology of the time, it took between eight to 10 people working the land to support one city dweller who wasn't working it. So an urbanization rate of 10% is right on the edge of what's possible. The Roman tax system subsidized the trade routes. So a, a ship from Egypt was paid by the government to haul grain as tax to Rome. So any cargo that could be taken on the ship in addition to the grain was essentially being carried for free, and it was much easier to sell at a profit then. So grain from Egypt and North Africa then was given away for free to the poor. Uh, in Rome and Constantinople, maintaining the size of the cities and making politicians more popular with the common people. The tax system is what enabled this to happen. It, we'll say a bit more on taxes in another couple of centuries. A little foreshadowing though, during the period we're looking at, these three things, these three characteristics, are going to be going away, especially in the West, causing big problems for a lot of people. All right, so here's the empire at, at 50 AD. Paul is just starting to write letters. Uh, the Julio-Claudians are on the throne. The empire is expanding. Things are good, generally speaking. Uh, notice where we have some numbers at the far end of the Mediterranean there. Uh, from, from bottom to top, that's uh, Judea, Etruria, Emesia, and Palmyra. Um, appreciate these for now. They're about to get absorbed. So when we move ahead to 100, the empire is expanding with the Flavians. Uh, you see these, those places got sucked up. Uh, Jerusalem is sacked in 70 by Vespasian and his son Titus. Uh, that's really important. Christian geography essentially stops being a thing. Um, so they take over the empire after a brief period of chaos. By the year 100, Domitian is on the throne, and uh, the book of Revelation may well have been talking about him. Uh, he was referred to frequently as the bald Nero, and, and so the, the castigations against Nero in Revelation may well be uh, focused towards him. Uh, if we jump to the year 200, there's not a lot of change, uh, but that's because we barely skipped over the greatest extent of the empire, when under the Antionians it, it briefly got as far as the Persian Gulf. Uh, at this point, though, the tide begins to turn. We had the five good emperors, uh, the last being Marcus Aurelius, who died in 180. Uh, what was good about them is that they had no male children, uh, and thus handed off the empire to a succession of competent adult rulers. Um, competent adult, this is a good thing. Uh, so this ends, though, with Marcus Aurelius. He did have a son named Commodus, uh, to whom he leaves the empire, and it literally goes all downhill from there. The assassination of Commodus in 192 kicks off the year of the five emperors, uh, which was a mess, with the African-born Septimus Severus coming out on top. Uh, and then emperors are going to be from Africa and Syria for a while, 
and lacking competent adults, this is going to devolve in what's known as the crisis of the third century. In a nutshell, we've got a bunch of things coming together all at the same time. Uh, we've got two plagues. There's first a smallpox type plague that comes through in uh, Marcus Aurelius's day. Then an Ebola type plague uh, hits Africa around 250. Also the climate shifts. So the Mediterranean region had been warm and wet. In the third century, it becomes colder and drier. So the Alpine glaciers increase and advance. European harvests suffer. Uh, this is actually a good thing for Roman North Africa. It, it actually makes grain and olive production even better there uh, and does make Africa one of the richest provinces of the entire empire. However, with failing crops in Europe, this also forces barbarian pressure against the, uh, the border on the Danube, so up here this area, partly through climate, uh, partly because of the horse archers from the steppes, so the Sarmatians, the Alans, the Huns, uh, are moving westward. The 50 years between 235 and 284 are referred to as the military anarchy, and this is where the empire almost collapses. So we almost lose Rome at this point, like completely. Uh, political instability, warring generals, barbarian incursions, and a breakdown of the trade networks almost ends the Roman dream for good. This is the state of the empire in 271. Uh, you can see it's broken into three big pieces. Uh, We've got the Gallic Empire, the, uh, what's left of Rome, and the Palmyran. Notice, this is a big deal, the Palmyran has got its hands on Egypt. So that 135,000 tons of surplus grain are being produced there. Now, the Emperor Aurelian was able to win the pieces back, but couldn't manage to keep things stable or to hold the throne for very long. Official government of persecution of Christians starts during this time, a little bit before 271, uh, Decius, actually, in the year 250. Um, you've got this succession of emperor after emperor after emperor. You're trying to keep people loyal. Uh, and so Decius um, really promotes the emperor cult, the cult of the emperor, and, and tries to get everyone rallied around that. Uh, anyone not offering, offering sacrifices to and for the emperor then is a traitor. Jews get an exemption because they're known monotheists. Christians don't. All right. Um, the military anarchy and the crisis of the third century is solved by one man, Diocletian, who takes over in 284. He takes an empire which had been running on the limited resources of the emperor's own household, so not terribly large, and overhauls everything. He doubles the size of the bureaucracy. He designs it to collect taxes far more efficiently. Uh, separates government into distinct civil and military functions, uh, no more combined roles, and he ensures that through better taxation, the various army units will be paid by the bureaucratic engine of the state, not by their own generals. So no longer do you have generals paying their troops who will then support him to be the next emperor. Uh, instead, this is where your tax flow goes. The taxes are all about supporting the military in its far-flung regions. The other really important thing he did is he codifies in law a cultural and linguistic division that had existed in fact for centuries, and he's going to divide the emperor into two pieces, an east and a west, each ruled by a senior emperor and a junior emperor in training. All right, notice two very important things here. First, each side gets its own breadbasket. So the west gets Africa, the east gets Egypt. Second, notice of the two of these, which one Diocletian picks. He takes the east. This is where the power and the wealth are. Uh, he creates his capital here in Nicomedia. Um, this is a not far from a little seaside town called Byzantium. Uh, take a close look at Italy for now, since we've got a nice map here with the cities marked. Um, I want you to notice three of them in particular. So uh, roughly the middle of the Italian coast here is Rome. Straight up from Rome is Ravenna, uh, which is on the swamplands uh, where the Po River hits the Adriatic. Uh, and then notice Milan, which is over here to the west of Ravenna at the other end of the Po River. Milan is the new capital of the west. It's, it's got that star there. Uh, that's why there's actually going to be an edict of Milan shortly that's important. It's because it's coming out from the capital. Uh, so 
the main government apparatus moves out of Rome to Milan, where the Western Empire's Western Emperor is going to be. Uh, and that, in fact, is why it's so important that St. Ambrose is Ambrose of Milan. He's the bishop in the imperial capital, which is not Rome. Uh, Milan's only going to stay the capital for about 100 years. Uh, then in 402, uh, it's going to move to Ravenna because the swamps and the seaports make it much harder to siege and to, to sack. So remember the locations of those, uh, Ravenna and Milan. Now, while he was a total whiz with administrative and military matters, Diocletian obviously knew nothing about human behavior in the Roman world, or he would have known that four emperors was never going to work. After Domitian retires and dies, all hell breaks loose, and at the end of it, Constantine becomes the sole emperor in 317. Uh, he and his temporarily co-emperor Licinius had issued the Edict of Milan uh, in 313, which made Christianity legal after a brutal period of persecution under Diocletian from uh, 303 to 311 or so. And of course, after taking over, Constantine decides to build a new capital for himself in the east, transforming that small seaside town of Byzantium uh, into Constantinople, the new Rome, which is built by him and named after him. Um, so he does get baptized as a Christian, uh, not until he's on his deathbed, though. That was fairly normal for political figures. Uh, the important things to notice, though, is right after he takes office, he starts providing money, uh, gives money to the churches so that they can build big churches. Uh, he offers tax exemptions to the church. And in Constantinople, he's building Christian churches, not pagan temples, uh, to, to decorate and liven up his new city. Uh, also, in 326, he's going to rebuild Jerusalem as an intentionally Christian city centered around the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And of course, Constantine is the one who calls and formally opens the Council of Nicaea in 325. Broadly speaking, the 4th century was a great time to be a Roman. Uh, North Africa and Egypt are humming along on full production. Things are generally good. This is a golden age for the church and its writers. But the Huns are on the move. And they're pushing in front of them groups who either A, don't want to be part of the Hunnic Empire, uh, or B, want to live the Roman dream themselves. This is an important point. You've, you've got the Danube here, you've got these Ostrogoths and, and Quadi and Skivi and such looking over the river. Uh, they're not saying, oh, hey, let's go sack that place. Instead, they're saying, we want to live like they do. We want to be able to take part in that Roman dream too. Uh, so. The goal of the barbarians generally is not to go sack civilized places, but to have a better life for themselves and their children. Now, the Visigoths get into the empire as early as the 370s. Uh, they get chased around by armies. Uh, they end up defeating a Roman army and killing the Emperor Valens at the Battle of Adrianople in 378. Uh, so they negotiate an area where they can settle within the empire as long as they are willing to serve in the army. And so that's what they do. However, uh, things are about to change a lot, partly because of that. Uh, Diocletian's empire-splitting idea comes back on the table, and the east and the west are decisively separated again in 395 by the sons of Theodosius. Uh, now, Theodosius is the guy who actually declared Christianity, uh, as defined by the Council of Nicaea, to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. A lot of people blame Constantine for this. It wasn't him. It's, it's Theodosius, uh, 380 or so. And also this period here, as, as we start to have a bunch of barbarian movements, this is when the West, capital in the West is going to shift from Milan over to Ravenna because it's safer, it's easier to protect. Uh, the Visigoths elect a king named Alaric who should have been named and recognized as a general by Rome, but he wasn't. And so he started raiding in response. Um, and so he, he invades Italy in 401. King Radagast of the Franks leads uh, 20,000 Goths into Italy over the Alps in 405. They get beaten back. Um, but on New Year's Eve of 406, the Rhine freezes, and a cascade of barbarians come across, mm -hmm. entering into the empire, and this causes a general collapse across northern Gaul, which is never, ever going to come back into Roman hands. 
Uh, Alaric and his army want to be paid. They want to get the recognition they believe they deserve. Uh, so they threaten the city of Rome itself if they don't get paid. The leaders of Rome respond to this request by slaughtering Gothic hostages, so mostly women and children, leaving Alaric basically no choice but to sack Rome in response. So, yes, uh, the Visigothic barbarian Alaric sacks Rome in the year 410. But this shouldn't be thought of as fur-clad civilization-hating barbarians going after the biggest city they can find. Instead, it's really more of a failure of internal Roman politics. Uh, Radagasus, on the other hand, uh, really was much more the fur-clad barbarian type. Um, he bragged that he was going to sacrifice the senators uh, to the old gods in the middle of the forum. Uh, he never actually got that far, though. Over in the east, notice the Persians are back. Uh, the Sassanid dynasty uh, is on the rise. They've been fighting for quite a while over on the eastern side, uh, but they're going to start keeping a closer eye on their western border and uh, engaging in some skirmishes here soon as well. By the year 450, things had really started falling apart in the west. The Vandals had occupied Spain, but then the Visigoths and the Suevi started pushing on them. In response, the Vandals did the obvious move and jumped the Strait of Gibraltar, and they sacked Roman North Africa, the, remember the, the richest province in the empire after Egypt. This is a huge deal. If you want to know when Roman authority in the West really starts an irreversible decline, this is it. This is the first big nail in the coffin. So the Vandal capture of North Africa breaks the Roman tax spine in the West and takes all of that grain. So over 125,000 tons of surplus by this point, given the, the warming, uh, and removes it from the Roman economy. It's real hard to have bread and circuses in Rome when the wheat ships stop coming from Carthage. So in the 430s, the Vandals sack Africa. Uh, most of Spain is lost to the empire. And the Huns are now showing up in force. Uh, we've got the Hunnic Empire here. Politically, things are a mess. Generals and barbarian strongmen start being the power behind the throne as a succession of emperors get placed on the throne in the West. Uh, and this actually is the second big nail in the coffin. When given the option at this point, your random fur-clad power broker would rather be king of the Franks and the power behind the throne rather than being the emperor of the West and sit on the throne. Uh, marriage alliances became very important here between generals, barbarians, Roman senatorial families, imperial claimants. Uh, and it was one of these that went sour, which led to the Vandal sack of Rome in 455, uh, which is why we call people who destroy things Vandals. It came from that particular event. Uh, let me briefly turn our attention east. What's going on over there? Uh, there are some campaigns in Armenia. The Persians, uh, again, the Sassanid dynasty is doing stuff. The Huns are causing problems over there as well, but nothing like the scale of what's going on in the west. Uh, power, cargo trade, is all shifting to the east. And we can see this very clearly in the archaeological record, looking at trade goods and, and what's moving where. There are also some major cultural tensions developing between Egypt and Constantinople that are going to break out on the theological stage, but they're not dealing with anything like the barbarian problems in the West. In the West, we have issues with barbarians. We don't have problems so much with heretics generally. Um, in the East, we have all sorts of issues with heretics and cultural uh, problems, but not the same sorts of issues with barbarians uh, that the West is having to deal with. Okay, now, quick temporal baby step. Uh, 475. Everything north of the Alps is now and will remain firmly in barbarian hands. Remember how Diocletian made a split between the military and civilian governments? This becomes really important here, because the Roman civil authorities are going to stay in place while the barbarian warlords and their guys are going to become the military authorities. So there's still a Roman feel to these places because the continuity of the civil infrastructure. What there isn't is the economy. The complex economy functioned as long as Roman taxes were transporting large amounts of goods to Roman military units. 
whenever and wherever the legions withdraw, so too does coinage, tax-based spending, and just as, or even more important, tax-based transport of bulk goods. You can no longer count on grain from Africa or even Sicily. It doesn't matter if your land is better for vines. You'd better be planting some wheat if you don't want to plan on going hungry. The economy becomes simpler and much more localized. Military units are now tied to local land that produces the food to feed them, not to a government, not to a centralized structure, or even to the king of a people. This leads to more localization and fragmentation of power structures. And that's the West. That's not happening in the East. What is happening in the East is that various groups keep invading through Pannonia, that's kind of this area here, um, just north of Greece where the Balkans are today. Thrace and Greece keep getting raided by wandering armies of Goths. Now, the Eastern Emperor is going to suggest to some of these that, hey, if you like Thrace, you're going to love Italy. Uh, and a Gothic king named Odoacer does just that. Uh, he moves into Italy, and the year after, this drives one more nail into the West. So, in 476, Odoacer deposes Romulus Augustulus, the last emperor of the Roman West, and with the agreement of the Senate, sends the imperial regalia back to the Eastern Emperor, Zeno, saying, hey, I recognize you as emperor of everything, I'll just be the king over here and keep an eye on things for you. Uh, and it's this act that will be identified as the fall of the Roman Empire. And I'm putting big air quotes around that, fall of the Roman Empire. There are several reasons for these air quotes. Uh, the first is because it's not really a fall in a political sense. Things are still going on much as they had before. There's a Roman civil structure that handles the taxes and records, and there's a barbarian military structure that handles, you know, killing whoever needs to get killed. Second issue with it, the Roman Empire is doing just fine in the East. So it's true to say that this is a collapse of Roman imperial authority in the West, but the fall of Rome isn't terribly accurate. Furthermore, Dates get picked by historians and politicians for reasons, and this is a very politically loaded choice of a date, and I'll tell you why in another 75 years or so. The other important thing uh, that's going to happen in, in the next, the following year, uh, is that the Visigoths are going to take most of Spain, leaving the Suevi with just a little chunk uh, up in what's now northern Portugal. So S Spain is essentially going to become the Visigothic kingdom. Um, all right, well, so the Eastern emperors never really trusted Odoacer, so they offered Italy to another Gothic warlord named Theodoric, uh, who history is going to remember as Theodoric the Great. Uh, now, I say Gothic warlord, uh, but he was raised as a hostage in Constantinople and had a formal Eastern Roman education, so definitely not your stereotypical fur-clad barbarian. Uh, he rolls into Italy, he fights with Odoacer for a while, uh, made peace, and as they had a big banquet celebrating their peace treaty in 493, Theodoric whips out an axe and kills Odoacer on the spot, taking over Italy entirely. Now, despite that little bit of brutality, Theodoric was an excellent ruler and, just as they had been doing, maintained a Roman civil service alongside his Gothic military. Now, everything was going just fine until his son-in-law and heir, Eutheric, dies unexpectedly in 522. Theodoric was old at this point, and was facing political restlessness from both Goths and Romans. Uh, if you know the name Boethius, uh, he's the author of, of a work called The Constellation of Philosophy, and uh, that work was written in prison just before Boethius's execution. Theodoric was the one who executed him because it looks like he was conducting some treasonous correspondence back east. Uh, and since Boethius was at that point the head of the Roman civil government, uh, and from an old and powerful family, he would have made the perfect candidate for new Western emperor. In any case, uh, Theodoric dies in 526, setting off a succession crisis, which was complicated very much by Justinian, who became emperor in 527. So, if the breaking of Roman if the breaking of the North African tax bind by the Vandals truly begins the dissolution of Roman order in the West, Justinian is the guy who ultimately kills it off. After Theodoric's young wastrel of a grandson dies, uh, and his daughter Amalasuentha gets into trouble with a nasty uncle, Justinian, in the guise of helping out Amalasuentha, um, invades Italy. Now, 
Justinian is the last Latin-speaking emperor of the East, who is himself only a couple of generations away from being a barbarian. However, he mounted a huge push for the idea of Romanitas, Roman corporate identity, and did a whole bunch of things under that umbrella. So he spent lavishly on building programs. The Hagia Sophia in Constantinople is, is his greatest architectural achievement. He also wanted to restore the old borders of Rome and launched wars against the Vandals in Africa, the Persians, and in 534, heads into Italy using the events of 476, that whole Odoacer thing, as a rallying cry of Romanitas to justify his invasion. And everything tanks there. There's a, gro a global cooling event, probably a volcano somewhere, that causes uh, crop failures and famine all the way from Ireland to China. Uh, this is followed by an oikumene-wide pandemic of the bubonic plague, uh, so exact same bug that's going to cause the Black Death 720 years later. Uh, we don't have great numbers here, but it probably killed somewhere around a third of the population, if not more. Then, to top it off, you had two different Roman armies and the various Gothic armies tramping the length and breadth of Italy, hacking each other up, and then the Franks and Burgundians popping over the Alps periodically to steal whatever they could that wasn't nailed down. After 20 years of war, famine, and plague, Justinian had his restored Roman Empire by the time of his death in 565. Many of the Mediterranean borders are in Roman hands. There are a few bits missing. North of the Alps, the Franks were establishing themselves as the big dogs on the block, but succession disputes and dividing lands amongst multiple sons got ugly pretty quickly. That's why you see a variety of names up there. The Visigoths are pretty securely ensconced in Spain. The other issue Justinian struggled with was cultural, political, and theological problems with Syria and Egypt. He even called a church council specifically to solve the theological issue to get these regions back. But, in trying to appease both sides, he just got them more mad at each other, caused some new problems, including a schism with the Western Church, and deepened the split. 600. In less than 20 years, the Lombards invade Italy, and it's broken up into pieces. It won't be a whole country again until the 20th century. Some of this is under Lombard control, uh, some of this is under Eastern Roman control, uh, and the duchies of Spoleto, Benevento, and the wee little papal state, which is number 19 here. The Avars are now doing what the Huns had done 150 years before, and while Roman forces currently hold North Africa, its production is not nearly what it was before the Vandals came. The East, therefore, does not get the benefit of the North African breadbasket uh, that the Western Roman Empire had been able to draw on 150 years in the past. However, economically, the East is doing the same level of complex trade it was in the 400s. In the West, everything is simpler, it's far less urban, it's far more local. Church-wise, Gregory the Great is beginning to flex some administrative muscle because the Church emerges as the only trans-regional organization in the West that can be appealed to to help sort out local disputes. Of course, remember, throughout much of this period, popes have often been hand-picked by emperors in the East and also deposed if they did things that emperors didn't like. For instance, Pope Vigilius was uh, seized in the middle of Mass and hauled off to Constantinople to be a prisoner there for three years because he wouldn't do what Justinian told him to do. Cities in the West now are shadows, often a tenth of the size of what they had formerly been. Because, without the discounted fr or free grain, people have to grow their own, and you can't do that in a city. The East is still urban, it's still complex, it's still pulling in solid taxes. This is that big shift to the east that we were talking about. The Persians, though, are starting to get a little rowdy. In 610, you can see the Persians starting to move towards the Mediterranean coast. And uh, in the years following this, they're going to get a lot closer. In fact, they're going to get there. They're going to capture Jerusalem in 614, Alexandria in 619, and Egypt itself in 621. The state of affairs is not going to last, though. Between 622 and 627, Heraclius, the emperor of the East, uh, is going to take back much of the lost territory. And Persia and Rome are going to come to sort of an exhausted peace in 629. And that's going to set the stage for what comes next. Because while they've been doing this, the prophet Muhammad has been preaching Islam in Arabia and uniting it as a force. Uh, after he consolidates religious and political power there, 
His armies expand out, and in just a few years, Egypt, Syria, and Persia all come under Muslim rule. Now, the Arabs had always been known as excellent fighters and were often used as both mercenaries, uh, used as mercenaries by both Persians and Romans. In the weakened state of both empires, the Arabs were able to accomplish an amazing amount uh, of effort in a short period of time. But they're going to hold most of this territory that they've just taken here for the next four centuries. And remember our economic piece. They united the breadbaskets of Egypt and Mesopotamia. Holding these two regions simultaneously, and for that long, gave them an enormous amount of wealth to work with. So this is the way things look by 700. By 700, the Roman Empire still exists. It is primarily in the east. Certainly the cities are. It's a combination of Roman political structure, Greek culture, and Christian piety. The regions that have been causing it cultural and theological turmoil are no longer politically connected to it, and never would be again either. It still has holdings in Italy, and its naval strength allows it to keep the big Mediterranean islands for now, although the loss of the Egyptian fleet meant that Arab raiders are going to begin striking everywhere from Greece to Marseille to Cadiz on the Spanish coast. There's still a lot of wealth and trade happening, but the world focus has shifted to the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The economic power centers are going to be the, the beginning and ending and all along the Silk Road, uh, from Constantinople, through Persia, through the Sogdian territories, to Qian in the western part of China. The city of Rome itself is existing at the sufferance of the Lombards, but it's going to start appealing to the Franks for help soon. And so it's not really until the year 650 or so that Rome and the Pope stop thinking of themselves as part of the sphere of influence of Constantinople and instead see themselves within a Frankish and a Lombard context. The Roman Empire is still a going concern, but in a different configuration and a different place from where it started. So we do have this dissolution of Roman order in the West. It began with the Vandal conquest of North Africa and ironically ended with a Roman reconquest of Italy that turned out to be for the most part a hollow victory. At this point, the West has left center stage of world history and has become the barbarian hinterlands. So, we have moved from here to here. Now, how does this help us know anything about the Church Fathers, about Christian theology, and what it means for us as we sit here currently quarantined in 2020? Key takeaways. First off, the Roman Empire and Christianity began in an urban geography with stable and efficient travel. People, goods, ideas flowed freely around the empire. This was essential for Christianity's beginning and its spread. Um, urbanization is really important here too. Uh, second, despite this free flow of things, persecution, sporadic initially, but state sanctioned from 250 to 311, prevented the maintenance of common beliefs and practices. So while it spread and, and had, had some general commonality at the beginning, Christian communities became separated and cut off. Not only that, a lot of their books were being destroyed, so communication with one another became much more challenging. As a result, uh, when we get to 313 and then the Council of Nicaea in 325, you've got a lot of Christian communities that are kind of checking in with each other uh, to make sure that we are all literally on the same page still. Three, cultural and linguistic barriers were exacerbated by political boundaries both within the empire but also outside of it. Theological stances were often tied into cultural, economic, and political realities in important ways that we forget if we only see them as intellectual doctrines. I alluded to this a few times when I was talking particularly about Justinian and the troubles he was having with Syria and Egypt. We see more heresies in the East uh, than we do in the West. In the West, there really aren't any new heresies um, after the 4th century. We see a lot more conflict around this in the East, and to a large measure, it's, it's connected to other things as well, or other things are, are continuing to drive them. Um, we'll look at this specifically as we get into uh, talking about doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ, Christology, all that good stuff. Four, the Christian fourth century, so 325 to 410, 
was a period of great flourishing across the empire, theologically as well as politically and economically. So this is, in some sense, a theological golden age. And it's why a lot of, a lot of things uh, look back to the 4th century. Uh, liturgical renewal in past years has looked back to the 4th century. Um, and it's seen as a, a, as a center point. Five, by the mid-5th century in the West, bishops and intellectuals moved from a composition mode to a traditioning mode. As political and economic conditions deteriorated, the goal is to preserve what was available. Uh, so th this is a shift from, from really working on new things and saying instead, look, we know great thought happened. Uh, right now, we need to save this. We need to make copies of things. We need to preserve it. We need to excerpt it if necessary so that this can be passed down so that the church uh, in our deteriorating situation can still continue to have the benefit of this wisdom. Six, from the mid-fourth to the early seventh century, theological energy in the East became tangled with the political and economic unity of the empire. Uh, so, one of the things that we'll see is in the later period of this in particular, you will have emperors trying to make theological choices, and these usually do not go well for anybody. Seven, finally, by the time we get to the eighth century, the church east and west recognizes that it had glory days in the past and looks to the authors of the past as guides for how Christianity ought to be done correctly. So the identification and solidification of a category called the church fathers really flows from this perspective and understanding that things were better, we had some really great people writing then, uh, and if we want to make sure our church right now, even under these deteriorating conditions, is still moving in the right direction, these are the people we need to go back to. So, that has been our quick, well, I was thinking it would be quicker than it is, a quick overview of uh, history of the patristic period from 50 to 750. Uh, this gives us a broad canvas uh, that we can then drill into and connect some dots.